Thank you for that beautiful offertory, Christine. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 12. Uh, We're going to be looking at verses 35 through 44 uh, today. Um, Several years ago, I I had the privilege and the opportunity for the first time in my life to travel outside of the United States. We were on a mission trip, and uh, we were in Bolivia. And during the course of the 10 days that we were there, different ones of us were asked to, to speak. Um, now, I don't speak Spanish, and they do, and so I had to use an interpreter uh, to help convey the message. And we had been given some pointers um, over the course of our preparation for the trip uh, about what we can say and what not to say that you know, translates into Spanish well and what not, and not to use you know, phrases that we understand that might not translate well. And one thing that we were told, and I forgot, was you never tell jokes because jokes don't typically translate well. And so I'm speaking to this group of Spanish-speaking believers, and I decide to tell a joke. Now, I should have realized, because I'm not that funny to begin with, that it probably wouldn't go over well even in English. But it, I tell this joke in English and then wait for the translator to interpret the joke. And then when the punchline is said and he says it in Spanish, they look at me like I had just grown an extra set of eyeballs. It didn't translate. Um, Sometimes what we say um, is misunderstood. Uh, That happened to Jesus. He would would say things, he would teach things, and the religious leaders, they would sometimes misunderstand him. And other times, they would understand him all too clearly. And they just didn't like what he had to say. Last week we looked at the greatest commandment of loving God with everything that we have and loving other people. And so now we want to look at a passage of Scripture um, following that that I think and hope we will understand. Um, It can be um, misunderstood if we're not careful. And so I want to make sure we understand things clearly. Uh, As Jesus taught, this is beginning at verse 35, and as Jesus taught in the temple... He said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all these who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything that she had, all she had to live on. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I pray uh, that you would give us open eyes, open ears, and open hearts for what you have for us today in your word. May we hear clearly, and may we understand by the understanding that you give us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you look at the end of verse 37, uh, the, the latter part of that verse has always stuck out to me has always amazed me. It says in the ESV, and the great throng heard him gladly. If you're familiar with the King James, it says the common people heard him gladly. It's the idea that the, the large group of the people that are hearing to his teaching heard Jesus gladly. And, and we, it makes us wonder, what was it about Jesus? What was it about who Jesus is that made people hear him with such Um, eagerness, such desire to know uh, the truth. And I think the reason is pretty clear. He wasn't like the other religious teachers. He, he, He wasn't like the people that they had experienced all of their life up to that point. And he lived out 
what he taught. He didn't just say one thing and do something else. In 2015, a study uh, was conducted between the relationship of millennials and the church. Now, millennials are those born between 1980 and the year 2000. So if you're a millennial in this room today, I want you to raise your hand, because I are one too. Okay, we got some here with us today. Okay, I are one. So, so this study, uh, this is the largest generation in American history. There are more millennials, more people born in the United States between 1980 and 2000 than any other generation in American history, even more than the baby boom uh, that followed World War II. Massively significant and important generation. So this study was done to determine what do churches need to do to attract millennials? Because, unfortunately, in most churches... That age group, born between 1980 and 2000, are poorly represented, if at all. Uh, In fact, only about 9% of this entire generation claim to be evangelical Christians. That means 9 out of 10 don't claim to be Christians. And so it's a massive uh, area of mission work. And so this question was asked in 2015, how can we reach these people? And as they studied this and as they asked these questions, one thing kept coming back to them, and that was the word authenticity. They asked questions about worship style. They asked questions about preaching. They asked questions about small groups. They asked questions about all kinds of different areas of church life. And the one thing that came back over and over again was the, was the statement, we want a church that is authentic, meaning real meaning not putting on a show, meaning not pretending, but living out what they believe. And I think if we look at what it says about Jesus, that the great throng, the common people, the crowd, heard Him gladly. And we realize that Jesus was different than the other religious people. The fact that Jesus lived out what He said, we can see a similarity there. Jesus was authentic. And so what we see in the passage today are two pictures. And I want you to ask yourself, as we look at these two pictures, which one are you? Um, You will fall into one of these two categories. The first is the picture of dead religion. He talks about the scribes. These are religious experts, legal experts, people who who ought to know uh, what the Scripture says, and he points out to them that they don't know what they think they know. He starts off by saying, how can the scribes teach that the the Christ, that the Messiah is the son of David? When if you go back and look at what David himself said, he said, the Lord said to my Lord, if he's his son, how can he call him Lord? And Jesus is making the statement, he's saying, listen, even if you look in the Old Testament, you understand that about himself, that he is God in the flesh. And the scribes miss this. See, dead religion is often built on bad theology. Dead religion is built on a misunderstanding of what God has said. And people begin to take these things and they they run with them because they think that it's true, but it's not. I heard someone in the grocery store just this past week. I was not trying to eavesdrop, but you know sometimes people talk loud and I can't help but hear them. And these two ladies were having a conversation in the grocery store and, and they were talking about something going on in their life. I missed the first part as I walked by. I heard the lady say, yeah, I just, I just always want to make sure that, that what somebody says just feels right to me. And I wanted to stop and say, lady, that, that, that's not a good way to look at it. <laughs> I didn't, I kept going, I was polite, I didn't say anything. But sometimes people just have bad theology, and the scribes had bad theology. They thought they had good theology, they thought they had it all figured out, but in reality, their theology was faulty. And if your foundation's wrong, guess what's going to happen? Anything you build on that foundation is not going to be appropriate. And so we see a few things that he describes there about dead religion. Beginning at verse 38, he says, you know, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seat in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts. In other words, Jesus is saying that dead religion puts on a show. Dead religion looks good. Dead religion sounds entertaining perhaps. Dead religion looks impressive, but it's dead. 
And it amazes me every time I go to a funeral and it's an open casket visitation, somebody somewhere will look at the person in the casket and say, oh, they look so good. And I want to look at them and say, they're dead. Okay? But, but you know, that's what we do sometimes. Dead religion comes along and we say, oh, it just looks so good. But it's dead. Dead religion is self-seeking. It says they devour widows' houses. In other words, they go in and get what they can get. They go in, they take advantage of people. Uh, they set up a 1-800 number. You call and make a donation and we'll send you um, whatever we're promising is our you know, pledge of God's blessing on your life. And they devour widows' houses. I remember several years ago there was a scandal related to one of these televangelists that comes on at 2 in the morning when nobody can sleep about how people were sending in prayer cards and you know, deep, genuine, concerning things in their lives, and they found these prayer cards in a dumpster. They took the money out of the envelope and threw the prayer request away. It's an example of devouring widows' houses. And dead religion pretends to be devout. It says, in for a pretense, make long prayers. They pretend to be devout. They say, oh, I'm going to be praying for you about that, and they never pray. They pretend to have it all together when they don't. They pretend to be something that they're not. That's the picture of dead religion. And then we see the next picture of authentic, radical sacrifice. The picture of authentic, radical sacrifice captured so beautifully in this story that Jesus illustrates with the widow giving all that she has. And just to give you some idea, you know, we pass an offering plate. So it's possible that you can, you can give and nobody see you give, nobody knows what you give. In the temple, it didn't work that way. They had big boxes set up. And if you wanted to give, you had to come up and you had to put your money in. And, and it was, had a metal opening to it. And so with coins, if you have coins and you have a metal opening, if you put a lot in, it makes a big noise. So guess what rich people would do? They would go and they would get as many coins as they could so that when they put their offering in, it made a really big sound. I remember several years ago at Vacation Bible School at one church I was serving, and we did an offering competition. But whose offering weighed the most? So we had a set of scales, and boys versus girls. And it took the kids about two nights to realize that pennies weighed a whole lot more than dollars. And so the last night of Vacation Bible School, and the adults really got into it too, the last night of Vacation Bible School, we had a guy, he had gone to the bank and had gotten $200 in pennies. That weighs a lot. And especially when the preacher's the one who has to take it to the bank the following day, it really weighs a lot. But, but, you know, it's kind of that idea you want, to, you want to put on a show. And so these rich people were bringing all their money in and they were dumping it, dumping it in to make a big splash. They were flaunting what they were giving. And here you have this little widow. And I can imagine she's very, probably very shy, invisible perhaps to the larger world, probably wearing tattered clothing. And she walks up and she takes these two small coins and she just barely, and it barely makes a sound. It barely even registers in the in the hustle and bustle of the temple. It's definitely not enough to get noticed. It's definitely not enough to get applause. But Jesus sees this woman, and he says she has given more than all the others. See, there's two principles at work here. One is that God knows what you give. God knows what you give. You can't hide anything from God. You can fool others, but not God. I had a preacher friend of mine uh, tell me a story when he was very early in his ministry. Uh, he was at a very small uh, congregation of about two dozen people, and uh, there was one gentleman in the church who acted like he owned the place. And he would go around, he would tell people what to do, and he would boss people around. It just really grated this pastor's nerves and so he went to the treasurer of the church because this man had said well I give more than anybody else here y'all should do what I say kind of that attitude so he goes to the treasurer of the church and he says is that true and the treasurer just starts laughing and said that man hadn't given a dime in 20 years 
You know, the point is you can fool God, but you, or you can fool others, but you can't fool God. God knows what you give, but also, and more importantly, God knows why you give. God knows why you give. Are you giving for selfish reasons? I know people, and, and they give because they feel like if they don't give, God's going to zap them. You know? If they don't give, God's going to get them that week. Well, that's a selfish reason to give, as if you're paying God off as if some kind of mob boss who's going to attack you if you don't give Him money. God knows why you give. See, the amount given matters far less than the heart behind what's given. And I want you to think about this. The test of generosity is not... And how much is given? It's in how much is left after you've given. Think about that. If you're a billionaire and you give 10%, you still got a lot of money left. But if you've got a dollar and you give a dollar, you've given less, but you've been more generous in your giving. Because the test of generosity is not in how much you give, but in how much is left after you've given. See, unfortunately for too many of us in the United States, we don't give sacrificially. We don't give radically. We just give because it's part of our budget, it's part of what we do. We write a check to the church, we don't miss it. And we do it because we should. I'm not saying we shouldn't give. But maybe, just maybe, we need to ask ourselves, are we as individuals authentically, radically sacrificing when we give, just like this widow? See, in contrast to the wealthy and the religious who put on a show, this poor widow stood out to Jesus because of her radical generosity. You know, one of the things that struck me as I prepared this week is if one of you came to me and said, I want to give the church every penny that I have, my gut reaction would be, don't do it, we don't need it. That would be my gut reaction. Here this woman, she gives everything she has to live on. She has nothing. And there was no social safety net. There was no, you know, no social security, no, no welfare programs, nothing. She would have absolutely nothing left. And she gave it, and Jesus commended her for giving it. So I want us today to take just a slight diversion from this text, but leaping from it. And look at five principles for God-honoring generosity. How can we have the attitude that this widow had? What can drive us to be more generous? And this is not just about money. Although that's part of it. This is about our whole lives, being generous with ourselves and everything that we have. Five principles of God-honoring generosity. One, generosity is possible when you know who owns it all. Generosity is possible when you know who owns it all. I want you to think about something, and I want you to write this down. Somewhere on your notes, I want you to write this down. God owns it all. God owns it all. Psalm 24.1 tells us, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. God owns it all. There's not a thing on this planet, there's not a thing in this universe that God does not own. When we get that right, it changes everything because we go from owning it to just being a manager of what God has blessed us with. And so it's my responsibility, it's your responsibility to see everything I have been given and to use it all for the glory of God. The mistake that many Christians make... and and I've made this mistake in my own life, is to believe that God asks for 10% and we can do with the 90% what we want. And that's not true. It's all His. He asks for 10% minimum as a means of carrying on the ministry of His church. 
But all of it, all 100% of it is His. And so when we go to buy something, when we go to use the money that God has given us, when we go to use the stuff that God has given us, instead of asking, can I afford it? Which we need to ask that question. But instead of just asking that question, we should ask, is this the best use of what God has given me? Is this the best use of the resources that God has given me? You know, when you think about it that way, it changes the dynamic of how you view what you have. You know, your house is not your house. Now, some of y'all probably say, of course, it belongs to the bank. But uh, the point is, your house is not your house, it's God's. Use it the way God wants you to use it. Your car is not your car. It's God's car. Use it the way God wants you to use it. Your toys are not your toys. Use it the way God wants you to use it. Use what you have because God owns it all. Second principle, God wants us to give. Here's a secret. You may not realize this. If God owns it all already, God doesn't need your money. I want you to think about that. It, we we got to get out of the attitude of thinking that, that if I give, I'm giving because God needs it. Oh, poor God. He just is so so strapped for cash that He needs my measly little bit to get by next week. God doesn't need your money. He already owns it all. So why do we give? Because God wants us to. Because God knows what's best for us. God knows what is best for us in every area of our life. And what God commands us is not burdensome, but it's always for our benefit and for His glory. That's why Paul was able to say to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 verse 35, at the end of that verse, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Giving is a way to be blessed. I can't explain it, but it's the way it works. If I hold on to something because I think I need it, because I think if I let go of it, it's going to cause me pain or loss or something. For whatever reason, I don't enjoy that thing as much as I used to. But if I let stuff go, if I give, whether it's of my money, whether it's of my time, whatever it may be, if I give generously and lavishly, the blessing that I receive as a result of that is far better than if I had kept it for myself. Giving is good for us. That's why God wants us to give. Thirdly, giving is a spiritual issue. Giving is a spiritual issue. This is not a bank account issue. This is not so the church can meet budget. This is not so the preacher can get paid or so that we can do new things in minute. That's not the reason we give. The reason we give is a spiritual issue. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. My experience as a human being and as a pastor has shown me something, and that is that the path of sin and spiritual failure often treads through the bank account. I, I, I have noticed in my life that when there begins to be spiritual issues in people's lives, one of the first areas to, to show that is in their giving. It may not be money, but it may be in volunteering, it may be in service, whatever it might be. See, giving shows what we value and who or what we trust. It's a spiritual issue. It shows where we put the, the focus of our lives. When we give, it's an act of of trust. Many of the practical problems that you experience in your life would perhaps go away if you understood that they are the root, the root cause of them is a spiritual problem. Many times we want to address practical issues because we think that's what people need help with. But ultimately, many of the practical problems in our lives are simply the fruit of a deeper spiritual issue. If we deal with the spiritual problem, if we deal with the root issue, the practical stuff takes care of itself. Same with giving. If I got up here next Sunday and I said, I want everybody to give more money, some of y'all would look at me like I was crazy. It'd be like when I was in Bolivia and something got lost in translation. Okay, The point is... It's not about what you give, it's about your heart in doing it. Just like this widow, it's not the amount that matters, it's the heart behind it. 
Giving is a spiritual issue. It shows where our heart lies. Now I say that, and some of y'all are thinking, I, 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 I got to start doing better. God's going God's to get me if I don't. Well, that brings to the fourth principle. Giving should be done willingly and gladly. Giving should be done willingly and gladly. Um, I know of churches <laughs> that they take up the offering as people leave. And I, I think there's a benefit to that to some degree, but they take up the offering as people leave. And it kind of reminds me of the old saying, it's free to get in, but it costs $5 to leave. You know, we don't charge you to get in, but we charge you to leave. Um, but, but this idea that you, you have to do it because you're compelled to do it is really incorrect. Instead, we need to see giving as something that we get to do, something that we have the privilege of doing. And 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 points this out well to us. Uh, the point is this whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Those of you who are farmers understand that, right? If you plant one seed, you're not going to get a field full. Okay, it's just not going to happen. You sow what you reap what you sow. So if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one. Every one of us must give. So there is an implied that it's something we must do, but do it as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. God loves it when we give cheerfully, when we enjoy the act of giving. Okay, some folks... You know, they put money in the offering plate because they feel like they have to, and they just get so bent out of shape that they had to do that. Don't give that way. Give willingly. Give gladly. Give cheerfully. See, we don't give because we have to pay God off. We give because we have been richly blessed by God's amazing grace. And it's a privilege to give. In my own life, earlier in my life when I was younger, I didn't have a whole lot. I justified in my own mind why I didn't have to give. I made every excuse in the book. Well, I don't have it. Oh, I give of my time. I give in so many other areas. And, you know, I, 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 I donate this stuff to the church and don't get reimbursed for it, so I'll count that as my gift. I made all kinds of excuses as to why I shouldn't give. And then I decided one day... That's not what God wanted. God wanted me to give. So I wrote a check to the church. And when I put that check in the offering plate, something hit me, and I just had this sense of, I am so glad that I get to do this. And I just almost started laughing that I had deprived myself all those years of a blessing of being able to give willingly and gladly. And fifthly, giving... Is an act of faith in God's provision. Logic. Okay? If God owns it all, which we've already said He does, if God owns it all, is God not able to give you everything you need and more? And yet so many times we act as though we have to hold back because somehow God's not going to provide. Notice what Paul says just after those last verses we just read in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able. And I want you to think about all the the times all is mentioned. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. God is able to give you what you need. He is able to give you all that you need. He's able to give you more than you need. Philippians 4.19 reminds us that God will supply every need of yours according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He is able to meet every need of yours. I had someone just a few weeks ago ask me the question that they had had some money that they had wanted to give to the church but they just felt like they couldn't because they, they were afraid that they would need the money for something. 
that they needed it for whatever was coming up in their life, and they were afraid that if they gave the money to the church, that they would be without. And so in conversation with this person, I said, I said, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you, yes, you've got to give the money because you've got to decide in your own heart what God wants you to do. I said, but I guarantee you this, if you give that money, you will not miss it, and God will meet every need you have. And I don't know if they did or not, but they said they were going to. And the point is, is that in doing this, it's an act of trust, an act of faith. When we write a check or give time or give talents to the church, here's what we're saying. God, I have a limited amount of whatever it is. Money, time, whatever. I've got a limited amount of it. But God, I trust that you have an infinite amount. And if I give this little portion, God, I trust that you can make up any deficiencies in any other area of my life. So here's the challenge for us today. I want us to look at your life. Look at your life and ask yourself, am I the picture of dead religion? Am I just putting on a show? Am I just pretending? Am I just acting a part? Or am I living a life of authentic, radical sacrifice? It starts by asking ourselves if we've given our life completely to Jesus. I'm not asking, have you said a prayer or have you been baptized? I'm asking, have you given your life to Jesus? Maybe you have, and maybe the stresses of life have just gotten in the way and you need to rededicate your life to Him today. But maybe you need to decide that today you are going to give. Not just money, but yourself. Everything that you have. Now your time is more valuable than money. You can make more money, you can't make more time. Your time is really more valuable than your money. You need to trust Jesus more than you trust yourself, more than you trust the stuff in your life, more than you trust the amount in your bank account. You need to trust Him completely. Do you trust, do you believe that God is able to meet your needs? And then the question that has been ringing in my mind for weeks now is what would happen if we as a church gave more of our time gave more of our talents, gave more of our commitment, and yes, our money. You know what would happen? We could reach this world for Jesus. If we're going to reach the next generation, if we're going to reach those that are lost in our community, it requires sacrifice. It requires us saying, What I have is not mine. It belongs to God. I will do whatever it takes with whatever God has given me to see God's kingdom furthered in this world. When we make that kind of commitment, when we make that kind of sacrifice, when we make that kind of decision, God takes that, God blesses it, and God does beyond anything we could ever imagine with it. Stop holding back because you're afraid. Trust God and see what God can do. Let's pray. Father, I thank You. I thank You that You show us so clearly in Your Word that You own it all and that You ask us to give all that we have to You. And so, Father, I pray during this time as we sing, as we respond, that You would stir our hearts to know what needs to be done. Father, if we need to commit our lives to You, Father, don't let us leave here without having done that. Father, if we need to recommit ourselves to You, Father, if we need to decide today that we're going to give of what You have blessed us with, Father, it's an act of trust, it's an act of faith, And yes, Father, it's costly, but it is more blessed to give than to receive. Speak to us now during this time. As you have already spoken to us up to this point, continue to speak to us now. 
It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Join with me as we pray to close today. Father, we thank you for this wonderful, sweet time of worship that we could gather in this place with your people uh, to think about you, to worship you, to glorify you. Now, Father, as we go, let us give all that we have to you so that we can experience the joy and the peace that comes from knowing you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.